That, that's me, your lighthearted host and expressionist. And this, this is my podcast, Love and Lies. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I have Terry Bowersock. Terry was the first to start consignment furniture with only $2,000. You grew your business in 1979, built it to $36 million a year business and 17 stores across the nation. Uh, you have been interviewed by Oprah Winfrey. Uh, there are Netflix, psychic shows, TV series, uh, on investigation channels. Mm -hmm. There are several books we got here, Bones in the Desert and The Other Side of the Crime. Yes. And uh, recently you've been approached by... Marianne Morgan is the psychic. So there's several psychics that worked on the case. Uh, Marianne Morgan worked on the Scott Peterson case mm -hmm. and the um, Holloway case. Natalie Holloway. Natalie Holloway, mm -hmm. thank you. And they're getting ready to do another show about it. And they've called me up just after you called me and said they wanted to do another show. Um, one of the reasons is ours is so documented uh, because it was in Tucson, Casa Grande, and Phoenix. They, they didn't know where she was. And so there was a lot of documentation by all three different police stations. So is it that they like, because they're psychics, uh, they like that it's documented because... Um, well, as for doing shows, there's so many pictures and there's so much documentation from the police and so many things like that that have been kept. Let's tell the listeners um, okay. what I guess I was known for the consignment success by all means, and it was amazing. Uh, but in 2004, uh, on uh, de December 13th, my mother was uh, murdered, um, but we thought she was kidnapped because that's the way uh, the charming predator, which was the man that did this, that came and found a woman that was wealthy and decided he wanted her wealth. So on December 13th, she was um, supposedly kidnapped, murdered. And then she was, we found her, which uh, by the way, the odds of finding somebody hidden in the desert is about one in a million. And we found her 13 months later on January 13th. So it was, December 13th, 13 months, and January 13th. Um, I think one of the things that you'll see as we talk about this, and I ended up writing the book, The Other Side of Crime, because there's the police story and there's the criminal story, and it's fascinating in itself because um, it, it, it had so many different facets to it. But the other side of crime was just like you hear um, people, uh, nurses, they'll hear their patients talking to somebody as they're getting ready to pass. You'll hear uh, women say, oh, my husband was turning on and off the lights again. You know, we all say those things kind of just to ourselves in mm -hmm. our home. And the reality is my mother was doing it in spades. I mean, she was just doing <laughs> lots of things. And it took me a little while to go, wow, this is from the other side. This is mom. Um, that's a very important point that you're making because I think that when you sit down and you somebody brings up the subject about um, somebody that has passed visiting them maybe in their dream or, you know, um, I have one in particular put a feather in my path and it's, it's strange where feathers will uh, be at my feet when yes. I look down and I'm getting ready to walk into something. So that to me, I wouldn't have really experienced so much had my mother not passed and for me to believe that um, these things happen. And so I think the listeners can now open up to go, this is where we're going to go, you guys. We're yeah. going to talk about the murder. We're going to talk about the facts, everything that's documented uh, that you know about it, don't know about. And then we're going to get onto this other side where uh, we're just going to explore because um, I'm very interested in, you know, what, what life is about and sure. I'm always trying to figure that out and so your mom's given you some information for us to share with everybody yes absolutely <laughs> okay so your mother's name is Loretta we've got a picture right here this is the one that was all across the news all across the nation all across. worldwide worldwide and internationally actually 
uh, the investigative channel um, came specifically to talk to us because it was happening a lot in London. I don't really know why London, but I mean really high cases of it. In America, I think we still kind of just call it a murder. I don't think we, they're a little bit more open over there, quite frankly, and about psychics and things like that and all the different things. But um, mm, uh, I didn't know that. And, it, and it's happening all over the world, but the most is in London and in America. So um, when I started doing some research, I read that she met him 20 years previously from a newspaper ad. Yes. And what was that about? Well, my mother was single. And for a long time, she had divorced my father. And we'd started the business together and building it and going. But she was lonely, you know. And, you know, she was saying, you know, that, that was in the era where all the men were going after younger women. And, and I think they're still doing that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Shame on them. There's some very beautiful older women. And these are women that have gotten divorced They've gotten back on the, the business track. They've built themselves up. They've made a success, and they're lonely. That's the very first thing to talk about here is the loneliness that we have in, in that area. So um, I had seen on Three's Company, remember they ran an ad uh, to find a guy because if they're wanting to rent a room, they're single. And my mother and I thought that up, and I wrote the ad. We wow, wrote, really? We wrote an ad to rent her room. And here's the biggest mistake about that. When, wow. When, so, he so he comes over, you know, calls up. So she up. places an ad in the paper yes. to rent a room. Yes. And her intention was to possibly meet somebody? Single. Single. So An this older is probably like the man. first start of like, you know, um, dating ads. And, <laughs> and now we've got, <laughs> yeah. we, we've got all these dating apps apps now so this is pretty interesting yeah so loretta and, and before i forget and we'll come she's back beautiful to i mean i can only imagine what and, she looked and, like. and and was attractive and and could, certainly could attract men you know i i we really want to always break all the stereotypes you know um, this only happens to this kind of woman or this kind of woman no this happens to all kinds of women whether this one went after wealth uh, sometimes they're and just beauty. going, yeah, sometimes they're just going after, you know, cover my expenses right now type of things. But um, the other thing that is going to be real different, we'll talk about kind of the signs to see because my mother is important to her. But typically, um, uh, and, and, he, and it's also they do it over and over and over. This is not one time. So right. he had done it to five women to before my mother. And um, usually it was only but three. He, he, just, he, he just conned them. He didn't. Correct. If he's only murdered right. her. Okay. Because he usually only stayed three to five years. That was what the record was all the way across the board. I think that um, he was getting older, kind of right. getting tired. Had to start settling down. And my mother was the generation stand by your man. And she got in there and she worked on, there was thousands of journals hidden all over where she, and she was always watching Dr. Phil, you know, how <laughs> she could solve this, how she could change this, how mm. she could do something, what she could do. It's interesting. She was really working to make it work for some reason. And so he ended up being there 18 years, which is another big thing here because, you know, in the beginning, we all did start going. What is this? You know, mm -hmm. what, I, you know, you you get a feeling, but then they're well, happy. Was he paying his rent in the beginning when he went to rent the room? <laughs> I, you know, or did he just did they fall in love? I mean, what yeah. happened when she shows when she opens the door and he's there and he's like, yes, he's handsome. He looks like my mother said Captain Stu being on the love boat. Okay, so he shows up and uh, you know, very charming. I mean, just a big beautiful smile and they're just amazing. And so he's telling all these stories and, you know, again, because you're renting a room, you, you share a lot of things. And he claimed that at the airport, he lost his wallet, which you're going to see in that list. They've lost their identification in their wallet. Oh, wow. And that he, okay. he used to be a CEO in Scotland um, and he had just gotten back from there. As it turned out, later we found out he had just gotten back from Texas being in prison. Uh, but we'll get to that later. And um, he just had all of these stories. And th then, um, so that was kind of the interview part. But then he definitely 
But she, but she was taken by him at this point. She was exactly. like, I don't care if you got identification. <laughs> well, and they very the room quickly. Is down the hall to the, the left. left. And, <laughs> and he very quickly stepped into and recognized, you know, this woman's alone and everything. So then he asked her out. So the first couple of days, what? how is it going? How's it going? And, you know, she's saying. She's like, we went on a date in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. And then they went on a couple dates. And um, so I believe they literally dated about um, two weeks and um, he had really just yeah. done everything to, you know, he can cook, he can do this. He wasn't and, moving out. It, you know, all of these type of things. He was still at the hotel at this point. Okay. And this is where the problem was with that little game we played. When it comes time to either, you know, say no or yes, <clears throat> you know, you're looking at it as a relationship, but now you kind of have to say yes early, you know, in two weeks because he's wanting to rent a room. And if she doesn't look, say it, it looks like she was not saying the truth. And so he ended up moving in two weeks afterwards. Okay. And you guys started liking him. We did. Because um, he's charming, he has the charisma. He's... And he's Virgo, just like Terry. Okay. And he's an entrepreneur, of course, and he's an inventor. You do lots of inventions. You Absolutely. Mentioned. And so the very first thing, I'm going to have to let you read that in just a second. The very first thing when he came, so they come over to my house so that we can have dinner together. I invite them over and I get to meet them. Now, at this point, you're like, you're $36 million in. Success? No, no, I'm still, um, I, I, at that point, I had started a chain here in Arizona and maybe one other place, not completely yet. Okay, so he didn't get to so walk into doesn't. the house and see... The, and, and think that wow, this family, this is this is yeah. something he could definitely well, take advantage of. No, did, we still were, uh, we were still wealthy at that okay. point, and you know my mother's house was just gorgeous, and um, I hadn't moved into the really big house yet, but I still, you know, we certainly had high end so homes, knew, right, and very well decorated, and of course, a little stylish. <laughs> um, so the very first time he came over, here it comes out of the pocket he's got this piece of paper and he unrolls it all and it is a, a lawnmower blade that is charaded that he says he's invented and so when you think about uh, people that cut but plants that come over they cut it aside because it keeps it healthier so he's invented a lawnmower blade that we can all invest in okay did that raise a problem you were like nope mm, no nope. you were just like okay let's support him he yes. my mom's falling in love yes he that fits in. He's going to look good in the family pictures. Yeah. All of that, like, yeah. you know. That was the first one. stuff. You might share with them. So one of the things that we read through Dr. Phil's stuff and through her stuff, and then I, at the very end, uh, worked with doves and uh, women's groups and all kinds of things throughout the country. Uh, for for the domestic violence. Domestic violence. And this is the six signs of uh, what's called a charming predator. Okay, charming predator. So uh, we've got here, stranger comes in to her life and appears to be wonderful. He's from out of town, has no current identification or references. Police call it ghosting. There's, there's a ghosting now. <laughs> it's a different, different kind of ghosting. <laughs> uh, no background information can be found on this person, which I'm assuming is you're ghosting. Googling and you just can't find anything on Nothing. this person. Nothing. Uh, he makes her feel like a priority in his life. He has a sad story, um, plays on heartstrings, has grandiose ideas and inventions, needs money to make them happen. He is working his way into the relationship while this is going on. He borrows money uh, from her and friends and works to separate her from family and friends. This is also a really big flag, yes. uh, red flag for yeah. a lot of people out there that in relationships like this. Um, personality changes, becoming condescending and nasty. So it changes. They, it's kind of like gaslighting. They, they yeah. tell you you're wonderful and all of these things and you're, you're every bit uh, important and then all of a sudden they start breaking you down. They talk about it being like the Stockholm Syndrome. Um, so, you know, and so the nasties are down the road a little bit, you know. Right, it, right after now, they build you up, get you addicted. It's to, all of this. Right. 
And then they do things where you're going up and down so that you are somewhat falling. You're starting to question yourself. Like, yeah. oh, is it me? And you're attached to your captive is what that is. Right. Yeah. Right. And then I, I think it, they make you feel like nobody else has ever made you feel. Oh, absolutely. And in particularly, uh, he was, you know, she was working with me, but, and then he got her um, to I buy her out so that he could have his first step of money. So his first step of money was from me buying her out as a partner. Mm -hmm. So he talked wow, her into that because we're going to go invent all these things. Right. And so we need this money from Terry so that we can go have all these inventions. Right. And um, so, you know, one of the things after this was all over with, and I read that, I, literally, as I tell this story, you can check off each uh, thing. Yeah, you can. And, and now you're saying her personality changes, which kind of goes with why would she allow this man yeah. to be able to get money from her daughter? Do you know what I mean? Like now her character, something's changing. Um, things that she would never have considered doing before starts to feel normal. Uh, the con swindles his way through money, retirement valuables, finally, I guess, um, the home, and then they move on to the next victim. But there was not a next victim right. after right. your mother. Right. And, uh, she, and she always says, this is one of the things she wants to say, is listen to the small taps on your shoulders. And that was what she said she made a mistake of. She had the taps, but she didn't listen to them. She just knew. And I think that that really has to do with the overwhelming sense of attachment and um, seemingly peace and love that you think that you have from all of the attention and affection that they're yes. giving you that you really don't want to give up because you also don't want to feel like you were stupid enough to fall for it. You're embarrassed to tell your family. Right. Um, because here you are, a successful smart who could do this yeah. to me. Yeah. And I thought the other thing. That, How could I be so dumb? And there was a lot of money. We'll kind of go through that. But well, the other like thing it. that she said was she stuck around to get her money back. So that's really Isn't important that to <laughs> anybody out there. You know, I guess there's got to be women that can do this too, to um, men, vice versa. But anybody out there, just if, cut your losses while you're ahead. Yes. If you feel like this is kind of like what's going on in a relationship, doesn't mean it's going to end up in murder, but my gosh, you know, just if you're unhappy in relationships like this, just cut your losses. You know, you said you something good there in a sense. Is this a male thing or is this a female thing? I think we used to call it gold diggers for women. <laughs> and I think it was the same thing because she didn't have any uh, feelings about what she was doing. But she had been considered um, a sugar mama. Um, for women, they're calling it charming predator because I yeah, don't consider her to, she, she didn't act like the sugar mama, like, oh, look what I have. The, well, that's taking what care the, of a younger man. Yeah, is that's that, what the difference is. In this case, there really is charming predators, and that was what this generation, and that's what the okay. male version of that right. is. Okay. The, the um, you were talking about uh, the money. Oh, uh, another important thing we were saying about, you know, she stuck around to get the money back. The other part of that is, and there was a pattern, you know, I, I will walk through literally how the money began to be that amount. So the other part was he'd also gotten her in debt because they are very good at knowing how to work your insurance claims, how to work the credit you know, cards. She's in debt and he's not. And so now <laughs> he's convinced her. She knows, he knows how to get through life right. on this edge thing of getting right. money. She's already lost money and then now lost. Now you have a protector. And so, they, so she's also, again, they tie you to the, the, the predator. They, they're always tying you in so that you can't leave. Okay, so okay. let's talk about, let's get down to the nitty gritty. Uh, let's talk about the murder. What happened? So one day. Okay, so um, we've gone through this process for 18 years, and he has... Uh, you know, first gotten the money from me. And then second, I ended up having to come back and giving him more money about the business because they didn't think I was going to succeed. We only had one or two stores originally. We just had the Arizona stores. And um, so this was way back 18 years earlier. Um, and then I had built it very large. And so they came back and decided they wanted more. And that kind of happened. And then Primarily, the biggest thing that was happening is that, you know, uh, they, they, he would come to me and we don't have money, my deal didn't come through, and your mom's going to lose her house, and so, of course, I would pay for that. Um, and the other big, big part of this was, and this is a real important statement here, is that 
he was always doing inventions. It was the, the blade in the beginning, and then it was the car cover that would keep your car cool, and then it was a, an IT thing, and then it was a sound speaker that, you know, riveted the house, and, and we invested in all of them, and we would, he, the idea is that he's always, he's always getting you excited. You know, he's always got this new thing that's going to make us all money. We're going to have the big house we're gonna, and all of this stuff. And the truth of it was that each time we, and so we would make new wills. So we made sure that we all got in mm, on this next new deal. Right. And of course, invest into it. I invested, her friends invested. They, they get everyone to invest in on their, they're, they're always collecting money. And what was really happening in there is he was always putting in a sheet that was power of attorney or a, a legal paperwork that he needed done. Because we started doing so many of them, we just started signing them and not reading the whole thing. And um, he was able, with all these different things, to go get money out of her insurance account. He was able to go to the bank and pull $50,000 out of her house towards the end because we had signed all mm. of these papers. So I, I think that as much as I did, I liked him. We all liked him. He was very charismatic. He would cook. He would do all these things. It wasn't until later I started learning how um, unhappy and how he was kind of nasty. I didn't know about the nastiness because when I was around, first she was the golden person with the money, and then I was. And so I became the second person that they were always just, you know, me and you. And your mom's kind of you know, getting old and not and losing it. She's not being very good. And so he was kind of always winking on the side to me, like, you know, you, me, kid, you know. Mm. So I got fathered a lot. So why did he kill her? So uh, finally, uh, towards the end, uh, he had gone and gotten most of the money everywhere. And he had gotten that last amount out of the bank of the $50,000. And then when that didn't get paid or stuff didn't happen, they ended up, you know, sending lots of information about foreclosure. Well, guess what they do? They collect the mail. So that's one of the things that they do to, to keep, keep her control. from getting the information Absolutely. that the house is getting ready to foreclose. So on. they're always collecting the mail, and and they and so finally it was on a Friday, and they had left the little note card on the door, and my mother got it first. And in the police report, I got a big little thick police report for you. It says that she started making phone calls that day to the to the banks to find she found out on Friday, and so um, I and then I'm sure she's tough, you know. And so on Saturday, um, there was just all kinds of weird things going on. And I even, by the way, uh, another interesting thing, I had given my mother flowers only two times in her entire life. And so one was right about that time I had brought her flowers for Christmas. And so one of the things that are in the police report is that they found the flowers skewed all over in the garage and there was just a little bit of blood in there. So that was something that kind of let everybody off on, I don't really know, they never put it to anything at that time. But um, so, so your mother's missing and they don't put the flowers and the drops of blood in the garage added up to like, he might be the one that... No, it was the first things written as, oh, okay. as evidence. And All so, right. so that tells you there was a fight. There was, right. there was, she, Something she mad. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, something is there. I had stopped by, I dropped off the flowers. I saw her that time and I didn't, you know, everything was at lunchtime and I think they hadn't had a fight yet. Uh, she had maybe just found out she was strained, but, you know, tight lipped, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, not saying anything. Uh, so whether it happened on Friday or Saturday, I don't know, you know, after I left, I really don't know that part. Uh, but um, so she was murdered and I don't know how she was murdered in the very, very end, um, you know, uh, along the way, uh, the first thing that happened after the murder. So anyways, let me go with this. So he does something. So she just comes up missing. There's something where they run off to Flagstaff. No. So she, she's, so something has happened in the home. Mm -hmm. And then, um, the, and then at that, that night, uh, I believe Ta called me and said, hey, your mother and I are going to go to Tucson tomorrow. There's a, a professor down there that I'm going to show one of my inventions to. And so we'll see you in a couple of days. You know, so there's the setup. I haven't hadn't talked to her. I was talking to him. And so... Then the next day, I'm at work, and I'm having one of our big So she could meetings. already be dead at this point. Absolutely. You don't even know. Yes. Okay. Um, 
So then the next day, I get a phone call about three o'clock in the afternoon, and it's Ta. And he goes, your mother's been kidnapped, or something's wrong, I don't know, but we went down shopping, and I can't find her. And I said, what do you mean you can't find her? You know, I was a little bit aggravated. And I said, go back and go to the front desk and ask for the security guy and, and get some, you know, go find out some stuff. And, you know, so he said, okay. And uh, actually, that's another thing that was on the camera is it does show him going to ask, uh, you know, that. But it was interesting. He went back and immediately asked, do you have cameras and something else to get more information? So it was another little bit of a clue later on. Um, so then he calls back about another half an hour after that and goes, I've looked all over and I, you know, she's not here. Um, and I, he goes, when I dropped her off, he said, I saw a kind of a truck pull up behind us, a van that opened up its doors. I didn't know what it was, but I think your mom's been kidnapped. Well, this time my hair standing up, of course, and jump into my Porsche and I make it to Tucson in an hour and a half, which is a two hour drive. <laughs> well, in a Porsche. Um. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's not. And when you want to get there, you want to get there. What color is your Porsche? <laughs> Red? <laughs> I hear they go faster. <laughs> they go, yes. They, well, that was later, but no, this one was burgundy. So I got down there and, uh, you know, you know, got there and, you know, so he's talking and um, saying, you know, I'm, I, I get there and say, we've, we've got to call the police. And so I move into, so he'd already was at a hotel because they were going to go stay at a hotel anyway. So he's already there at this hotel. And I said, well, where is it? So I go over there to the building and we drive her. I said, now, where did you drop her off at? So I'm looking up to see if there's cameras. And so actually, no, excuse me. He's looking to see if there's cameras when we went back there. So we went back. And when I got back to the hotel, I said, listen, we're going to call Channel 3 and all the stations because I know them from having a store there. And we're going to call the police. So at that and everybody point, knows who the hell I am. So <laughs> we're going to call in all the dogs. Absolutely. So they, and then uh, the other thing is, and there'll be a picture we'll show a little bit later, but um, I, I wanted to make flyers. And I was, I'm, I'm going to go out and hang those flyers all over the place. So we went on his a computer with just me there and he but he pulled up a picture the two of them I cut it in half and put her put made a flyer that day and went and had it made the whole thing so I mean I, I moved right into action and then the police showed up now another thing I didn't know about uh, that the police told me about so he, they're there just casually talking and and I'm kind of going let's get going you know right. but they do that you know to see if they just have these conversations and so they said to me we knew you hadn't done it but we weren't sure about him as it turned out there he was sitting there defragging everything on his computer while the cops were there just by his hands so he was taking all the stuff he had in the computer and getting it off and the other thing they were talking about watches and things like that and it's like again i was like what are you guys doing and and then the police officer uh, had Ta step out. He goes, have you looked around in this room? And I said, I did briefly. And he goes, I want you to walk around in this room. That was the first time I took a really deep breath. Um, so I walked around and over here is about six uh, suitcases of his with a lot of clothes in it. And over here is a little overnight bag, little little suitcase with four pants, four socks, four shirts, four skirts, exactly like this. And uh, later on, I kind of realized makeup that you had reached in the drawer and put in. Right. <laughs> and so not a woman, a woman did not pack that. Oh, no. Uh, so very little. And then over here is her bags of a lot of jewelry. I didn't realize how much was in there because they were still closed. Uh, the next day they had pulled everything out. And there's also a whole bunch of guns and knives. I w and, and bullets and stuff. And he said, oh, I'm bringing them down here. They're having a big show and I'm going to sell them. So there was always all of these things, but he had all of that there. And so the room, you know, definitely looked like I'm going to be gone for years and she's only going to be gone right. overnight. There, they also found a pickaxe, gloves, blanket. Yeah. Uh, that was the next day. So we went through that whole process with the police officers and then um, they went ahead and went back to the place and we were going to go searching. So they left. And um, I was, I actually had a friend with me at the time. And I, I looked at them and I said, I think we need to go talk to the police. And so we drove down and I said, listen, I'm not saying that anything happened, but 
this relationship has been strained mm -hmm. and it's not, you know, there might be something, but, I, you know, I doubt it. But I wanted to make sure I said that. And so um, then we continued to search all night and then the police came back again the next day. And that's when they, uh, they had called and they said, we're on our way. And so interestingly enough, stuff starts getting said. So one of the first thing he says when the police are coming back to interview us is that darn Scott Peterson case, he was the one that killed his wife. Mm -hmm. um, they, ever since then, they always think it's the husband and they're gonna go after him instead of getting out and looking for him. And so he said, let me get, I, you know, I wanna give you something that I have in the back of the car, the back of the van. And so I walked out with him and he opened the back of the van and there was the shovel and the pick. And I remember seeing it, but kind of your brain doesn't, but it does. Right. <laughs> and um, he pulled out uh, a whole bunch of money that he had because they had borrowed a lot from me that he wanted to return to me. Now he's wanting to pay you back. So he's wanting to get that money out of his hands and get some things into my hands. And so he does that and then they show up. So it takes them how long to find her body? So, um, so they do all the investigating. They finally take him in. Uh, they have, you know, interviews with him and, and he, he's, a, he's very good at lying. Right. And he just starts making all these excuses. And um, because of the, the listeners need to know that this is like very short lived. Yes. It's like one, two, 14 three days. days. And yeah, what does he days. do? After 14 days afterwards, he kills himself. He hangs himself. Yeah. 14 days after he right. reports her being kidnapped, and now you guys start searching. Right. Now he's hung himself. And he's, and he's claimed his Miranda rights, and so he heads back to Phoenix because we're, we're down in Tucson, and we live back up in Tempe, Phoenix. And so he heads back to Tucson to stay at a, at a hotel. And at that time, the police officer said, you need to split off and go home on your own. So we both leave from there. And this is just, you know, two or three days after. Now, um, I believe this was then the first thing that happened psychically. So my friend and I get back to the house and we're sitting in my room. So you're bringing in the psychics at this point? No, well, no psychics yet. Okay, no psychics yet. Yeah. Oh, right, so, because now you've got to find her body. He's yeah. dead. Now you've got to find yeah. her body. Yeah. So we're back there and we're sitting on my in my bedroom. And all of a sudden, I hear... Kind of I mean, like one of those Christmas cards, those cards that opens up and it makes sounds. So I'm hearing, which was happy birthday to you. And in my whole entire lifetime, it was the only song my mother sang to me every year. It was like kind of a signal. And so I hear it. And I, so I asked my friend, I said, do you hear anything? And she says, happy birthday. I said, okay, thank you. And I looked all over and I found the box, but it was in the closet with books on top of it. So that apparently was the first thing she did to, as you think, maybe let me know she is on the other side. I wasn't ready to say that yet. You weren't ready. To, you just thought it was weird. And you're like, that's the song that my mother, that's Always. the only song my mother's ever sang to me. And it's packed in a box in a closet. Nothing could have yeah. Yeah. made this card yeah. go on that's probably five years old it yeah. should be out of its battery so then they just speed it up so then he does this whole ho uh, hotel scene and goes back to the house and at the house he does hang himself <clears throat> the media show up and everything i was um uh, at, at down the road and um one of the things you know how she killed her but he also in his own death, uh, it was really a painful way because he, you know, he did it with an extension cord, which was really difficult out in the garage, and he hung himself. So that wasn't non-painful either. And I always, I don't know, I always try to feel like, you know, that he maybe felt guilty or he felt something. Um, I mean, you liked him. I did. All the way to the end. Yeah, I did. He was, uh, you know, he, uh, he, you know, you know, he'd even say he was kind of like my stepfather. They never married, um, but he was always charming. And I guess one of the things you learn later on is if their full-time job is, is uh, you. Right, then he doesn't have another job. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did they think? How did they think that, they, that he actually killed her? Well, 
she hurt I, her head? Did I, he choke I, her? I, yeah. And, and so this is where then, um, so after this happens, this is where the first psychic comes in, which is Marianne Morgan. And she's the one that had, like I said, had done the other cases. And I, you mentioned earlier, I said, so this really turned into a psychic thing. And you turned around and said, well, wouldn't you if your mother was missing? Yeah. And yeah, so were you into psychics and all that stuff before? Not a lot. I mean, a little bit like everybody. Entertainment, da, yeah. da, da, da. Yeah. now you're like, I yeah. need to find my mom. And Well, the other thing is missing. It, was, it became national quickly. So it got Now started, people are reaching you. Yeah. And they reach out and talk to you. So Mariana actually called me and our friend had, had heard about her too. And so it kind of all came together. And I even Allison's group that was that did the show Medium. Their group was here in Phoenix, and they came and talked to me. So lots of them came. But um, Marianne Morgan came, and she saw that the death happened at three o'clock on Friday, whereas he claims everything happened on Saturday. So that's the thirteenth. And so she saw that. She saw uh, that uh, you know something had happened, and she fell and hit her head. It didn't kill her, but while she's laying there. Um, Probably, I don't know. Uh, she definitely was choked because on his hand, he had fingernail scratches on his hands. Mm. And so he's obviously something here because she has mm -hmm. scratched his hands. And um, the only other thing that I know is at the very, very, very end when they found her, there was a plastic bag possibly put over her, but down in her throat that had gotten down in her throat. Okay. Um now they find her body in the desert. Mm -hmm. Well, they did. Well, they we didn't. Did. <laughs> we, you did. So talk about that. So after uh, everything's happened and he's committed suicide, you know, my first thoughts were, oh, no, he's the only person that knows where she is. Mm -hmm. But at that point, I had a pretty good idea, you know, that it probably was him. Um, but I have to say because he had really convinced me she was kidnapped. That's really what made me go out and look, you know, at the end of the day, and this is also what made me, if a psychic wants to help me, if, you know, my friends want to help me go search in the desert, whatever, when something happens to somebody, you'll do what it whatever. takes. It doesn't matter. You don't think about all the, oh, what's the world going to think about it? I was going to find her. And it was, I still was thinking, um, you know, she's in the room somewhere, you know, being tortured. And you, you know, you still doubt because this is still this man that's told you all these things for these years. And, you know, I looked him straight in the eyes and he said, I, you know, I, I, I don't know where she, I said, where, where is she? I, I, at the very end with the, at the hotel, where is she? And he says, I can't tell you. I don't know. I didn't do anything. And that's all I had to go by. So um, I immediately started figuring out it's got to be between here and, and Tucson. Tucson. And they don't show that she showed up at the hotel, and they don't show that she showed up. And um, they do show that in Phoenix, there was she had they bought gas, you know, enough to get there type of thing. So that meant, you know, it, it, they began looking, you know, behind the houses and stuff like that. But it made a whole lot more sense. And uh, the psychics had kind of one of the first psychics that I had talked to because I'd gotten out there in the desert, and I said, okay, well, what do I do? And they said, she's in a real sandy area near some bushes, and you're standing here going, that's the entire desert. <laughs> <laughs> There's 100 miles between here and Tucson, right. and it's 100 miles wide. This right. is the largest cat sandbox I've ever stood <laughs> in with, with bushes. And I, at that moment, realized, oh, my, this is going to be difficult, um, and I am going to need help. So we began, uh, it was on the news just all the time, and we began search groups. Um, so well, again, one of the things that happens here, uh, there's a murder, but there's no body. So the police thought until there's a body, it's not a case. Right. That was a new, that was a real awakening for me. Um, they stepped in and helped and gave me ideas, but they actually could not go out and search. And so it left me. And so we built up, uh, we were on TV just all the time. And we went out every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for a year. And people would show up by 60, 60 of them and 30 of them and 40 of them. And towards the end, there's 10 of us. And every weekend, we, we went through the desert. Every weekend, we were on the news. Every weekend, it was all pulled together. And as it turned out, 
it was so from here to Tucson it, if you go to Casa Grande and you go on Highway 8 which is the old way you go to San Diego from this area and you go out about it was probably about 25 miles down channel or down the freeway 8 we had searched that area but we had only gone about 18 miles out at the time and um, so um, it was down the road a little bit further at the Blue Motel and everything wow. everyone that was even a little bit psychic they always said I see blue I see blue it's like there's no blue out here right uh, you know and I heard that over and over well there was an old hotel that was you know wow. and it was the the, the 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 front was blue the water tower was blue all the all the swings were blue it, it was you know when everyone finally the police and that drove by and it's like oh my gosh blue <laughs> blue <laughs> and um, so how it was is our group was about 18 miles out and then there was uh, again, one of the psychics, the, uh, Channel 5 threw, flew in. They had come in and they said that a family would find her and that she would be laying up near a tree and they would be, and her jewelry was all right there. And at the time I said, there's no water out here and I didn't, there's no trees out here. So I kind of dismissed it. And as it turned out, uh, it was a family. It was a son and his mom and dad, and they were out looking for stones to make jewelry and it was the sun that found her because um, it was and Arizona deserts very hard so he ended up there was an old riverbed and he wasn't able to dig deep so one of the things you'll see in one of the pictures is I literally could put my hand in there and she was only you know that wow. deep in because he couldn't dig into that ground and so what he did is he got a lot of rocks and he basically entombed her so he put rocks over the top and uh, and so over a period of time and we did have some rains her um, skull had come up forward and was uh, so the skull was showing through and that's what the sun found and um, sitting upright it was kind of Jewelry. a little bit yeah so all this, uh, behind signs. her instead of a tree it was one of our big cactuses yeah riverbed jewelry tree cactus and that's where she was and uh, he looked down and they because they knew about us being out uh, wow. he said he saw her he says that's that lady's mom she's smiling and my mother had beautiful teeth Aww. yeah so um, it chills all over my body right now yeah so they immediately you know get a hold of us through all the things and then um, so I had to go back home and then the next day they took me me out in the police car how did you feel I mean were you like thank God she, I just know she's not tortured did you have people it's it's you know when you look that long things change as time goes on you know at first I if I can just find her and then eventually if I can you know at least know she's okay at least know stuff you, you change as you go through the process I remember seeing this on the news and I had prayed for you so many thank times you. in I really appreciate you taking the time out to letting me interview you. It's crazy that you're, you know, in front of me and, and we're talking about this one years ago. This was just so, yeah. you know, everywhere you looked. Um, so she's gone, she's passed and now life kind of gets, let's touch on that a sure. little bit because life now kind of seems like it's beginning for you in a different way with her that, um, you're communicating or whatever's going on, but you're learning through her yeah. about life. Yeah. And you're saying that um, she's studying in heaven. Yes. She's, what is that about? So um, from the beginning, so this is also long throughout the story. Um, I had the psychics coming to me and then I had another gal who was a medium, uh, which is Tammy Holmes. And she calls me up and she, she says, your mother's moving everything around in the house. <laughs> and I go, oh, that, that would be her. And I, so I finally went and met with her. And um, so Tammy reaches out to you and says, this is my name. And, and, yeah. and I'm and starting you, to And your mom's here. And, I'm mom. and she lived here in Phoenix. She goes, I'm supposed to get a hold of you. And she's a well-known medium all over the country. And so I go and, and start communicating. And the very first thing she does, and what I loved about what she did 
she would always do something that only I would know. And I wasn't thinking it because I asked all kinds of questions. Is it because of what you think that they read? And mm -hmm. I did all of that. So the very first thing she goes, your mother's standing here holding out a purse. I said, she wants me to guess how much she paid for it because all of her life, she was a garage sale shop. Guess what I paid for this? Guess what I paid for this? And I said, and she, I, so I said something and she said, uh, down there would have been $45, but up here it's free. And I said, wow. that's her. You're like, mom's here. Mom's here. Absolutely. And so that, that's kind of, so, uh, you know, and then another thing that happened that she did, and this was actually one of the hardest ones. Um, this was rather early on also, is that I was asleep and I've never had bad dreams or freaked out or anything. And I clearly had a dream where I went to her. And I was laying there, like, with her in her body, and she was wanting me to see, uh, in, in that area, there's a small airport, and she was above the pattern. She could see, you know, the planes fly by from where she was, and she wanted me to see that and go there. So I actually was there, and um, I, I can't remember all of it, but then towards the end, I heard these clicking nails coming across the rocks, which were coyotes, and I could hear the coyotes. And at that point, I felt them sniff my fingers, which her hands, you know, she's not very buried. So she obviously feels the sniffing her hands. And I woke up holding my hands up oh, and screaming. Wow. But as it turned out, when I got to the place where she was, I, could, I even drew the picture ahead of time. And I said, this is where she is. And it was exactly the picture. Of, of so she visited you very early on. And, get, and you're getting this sensation of coyotes sniffing your fingers, which would have happened while her body's decomposing. Yeah. And you're waking up, Starla, you're writing down oh, the I'm vision of everything. what she gave you. And then when the family finds her in the desert, the psychics, yeah. hence, are there. And now the other side of what she experienced sure. in her grave. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, and the other one that's that was, a lot to take in. Yeah, the other one that was really fun. The first, uh, so once I started getting out and searching the desert, uh, I would I would come back and I every time I believed I was going to find her. Right. I mean, today's going to be the day. <laughs> I would talk to someone and we would get ideas and what do you see and what cross streets and it's twenty miles. Blah. And so we had a map, uh, and you can see on the map I literally drew out all the pictures of where it made the most sense. Like when you first get out into right. the desert, this is the first place if you're driving along with a right. body, this would be the first place I would pull off the road and hide her. So we had figured out just logically, and we also knew he had gone into the Love's truck stop to get some food. So we knew little things mm -hmm. to go out around. And so we mapped out everything. But each time I would come back, I would just be exhausted and I would sit down and be so unhappy. And the other thing I had in my house was a, a intercom and it was broken to talk on, but you could still turn it on and kind of hear the fuzz. Well, somehow I believe my mother found out how to tap on the wire. And I'd never heard that. Never, you know, I could turn it on here. So I'm hearing this when I get home sitting there and I'm looking around and trying to figure out what it was. And I'll be darned, it was my intercom, I, you know, I listened, and it was coming out of there. And she only could usually do it about a minute to maybe two minutes. But every time I came back from searching, she did this. She did every it. time you come home, the intercom is tapping. Intercom, and I'm sitting there and all that. And it was, it began to kind of be, it started me talking to her. It started me, like, connecting and talking to her. And um, so then finally, one of the, the big points about the intercom is uh, December the next year, I had gone out Christmas shopping and it had been one year. I couldn't shop. I, was, I just would walk around and like a zombie. And I came home and I finally was in the kitchen and I finally fell apart. I mean, completely the whole thing, you know, hitting the refrigerator, falling down, sitting down, crying and bawling and <laughs> And she kept going and kept going. Because at first I was just, I just shut up. You know, it was just, just leave me alone. And she kept going and kept going. Aww. She did it for 10 minutes. And I remember sitting there, why don't you just play a Christmas song while you're at it? And I ended up laughing. I ended up, she stayed on that thing until I was laughing, until I was, I had let it go and had moved on. And it was, uh, it was amazing. That brings like, that brings tears to my eyes. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. 
So um, something about what you just said, I just completely yeah. feel it. Yeah. Um, when we talked, when you and I first met, you had mentioned about life being about lessons, her sharing this with you and about it's how we handle the depths of our emotions and not yes. the ugliest of murders. Are we supposed to, not meaning just murders, but it's how we handle the depths of our emotions yeah. that matter in this life and that's connected to lessons? Yeah. So Explain that. Here's the big one. Um, through, again, this uh, towards the end and through the psychics and so on uh, and, and communicating with her, um, I had seen little signs along the way, but what she imparted to me was that... Um, Another thing, she had gone to a psychic a year before she was killed, and the, and I found this in her journals. She had journals all her place, and it said you would be more famous in your death than in your mm. life. And we were pretty You're famous. You're reading this out of her journal, and so I asked her about that, and she said she her spirit, not so much her physical self, her spirit knew probably about five or six months before it happened that it was going to happen. And she also saw that there was going to be a lot of people wanting to know this story. And she knew I liked to get on TV and stuff. <laughs> you were the name of the family. You were like getting out there. And, and she knew that this would make a difference in people's lives. And so she stayed anyways. That was the life. That was, that was the very first thing. So when you go back and say, what are we doing down here? We're down here. We're all connected. Yes, we are. We're learning from each other. Yes, we are. People come down and they're a little bit not good, mm -hmm. evil, whatever you want to call it. And the rest of us are doing things on many different levels. And they're all lessons. And we're all looking out after each other, believe it or not. Yes. And she chose. And, and he wasn't going to let her go. Truth be known. She knew that. <clears throat> and she chose to stay um, so that I would be sitting here today sharing this. And that's so, so it's just something that she accepted yeah and and so it told me you know and she also talked about forgiveness you know in the beginning there's a also a a, a, a letter a note that Ta had left and said we had uh, promised to be with each other for eternity so we shall and I the first time I asked her that so I said are you there with him for eternity and she said blank no she said hell no <laughs> she, she, she did Ta ain't here <laughs> and this was the first time she'd also said I'm going to go talk to my uncle to raise my vibration to help you early on and the other thing that she had said is that she she went and visit she could go visit him but he couldn't come visit her so it's kind of like the Catholics and the levels of the other mm -hmm. side and everything is vibration. So vibrationally, he couldn't go to where she was, but she could go. So because in his lifetime, he failed and didn't learn his lessons. He repeated. Yeah. And so she raised yeah. to the next level because yeah. she completed what her life's purpose was. Right. And apparently it was being And she called murdered. it energy hospital. He, was, okay. he stayed in energy hospital for a long time. Because he, he still to has to learn. Learn stuff. And so at, at first, wow. it wasn't that, you know, oh, forgive him. But it was much later on, you know, years later. Um, and so there was another time where Tammy actually came down here. And we did an interview on Channel 12 live, or Channel 3 live. And he had never come to us in the psychics. He didn't want to. Didn't want, in, didn't want to. And so we sat down to do this interview. And the very first thing is Tammy goes, oh, no. <laughs> I said, what? And she goes, Ta's here. And I'm like, oh, on, on yeah. air. <laughs> it's like, uh, and I, and I, we have a couple on of that. Air. On air. And all of a sudden, I didn't care what cameras were there. I wanted to know from him, did he do this? Because I had never heard the answer. Right. And I asked, you know, so what I asked trickily, I said, why did you hide her versus why did you kill her? Mm -hmm. Why did you hide her? And he answered, because I didn't want anyone to find out and to find her. We actually answered that on there in front of the world. And so we talked for a while. And, you know, as time went on, my mom would say, I'm sitting here with Ta and my sisters and my mother and stuff. So, so he made it to a... She had come, you know, so in the beginning, not so could, much. She'd go visit him in the... But once you hospital. learn about what we're all doing and, 
you know, we also can go back and say, I, you know, I talked, finally found his parents and his sisters and so on. He was lying from the time he was very, like in fifth grade, very young. And so you might put pathological liar in the category. I don't mm -hmm. know. But he obviously was delusional in the things that he would see and what you learn about it. It's just like our whole life. You know, each time he would come up with something, it would start off with a thing and then it would build and we'd have, have reports on it. And it was all about um, the high for them is getting... that it got grandiose uh, and the more we were all responding to it the more it fed what he needed in life so um huh. wow that is a lot <laughs> yes and i guess it's taken you how long has it been like 10 12 13 years 13, 13 years <laughs> man there's something with 13 yes with me and you and i as the birth of my mother to the other side and the the biggest thing that has made a change for me is you know, people still say stuff about psychics and all that, but the things that she has told me, and I'm always checking myself, you know, she would, she would come along like the next year and she goes, the psychic, she's on the phone. She goes, I see velvet and stuff. And I said, I'm standing here in a full velvet outfit. Does that count? Yeah. I mean, anybody can judge whatever, but until you, you know, walk through certain circumstances exactly. in life i mean you're you don't know what you'll reach out to and the process and your process yeah. and how you find answers or learn or consciousness yeah. and helping others and it's just being open to it um i have three questions that i ask every guest okay and i want you to give me your answers uh where is the love in your story oh i um, so one of the things on the list is they separate you. And so Ta towards the end had definitely separated my mother and I, and I kind of didn't like her. And she, I don't know what she felt about me. I think uh, later I found out uh, she felt guilty all these years for the money that was taken from me. I learned that from that. But um, so when I first began looking for her, I was kind of just, you know, doing the actions of it and, you know, you know, et cetera, mm -hmm. not a lot of feelings. And so one of the very first things the psychic said, I said, can, well, if you're a psychic, can you just tell me where you are? You know, you know, right. mother, tell me. And she says, uh, not till you find me in your heart. And oh. so it took me a while of being out in the desert and so on. But I have to tell you, towards the end of that year, I can't wait till I go to the other side and run to her arms. I love her. She's the person I love the most on this earth. And I couldn't have said that before. I love her. Mother and daughter. Mm, that's love right there because you're just like yeah. your eyes yeah, and your smile and your face right now. Thanks. It's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, what is the lie? <laughs> Talk. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say <laughs> You know, it was constant. And it, it, it's, it's so surprising that we believe so much of it. But it was just that it was lying all the time. And, you know, at the end, I thought I was going to see kind of half and half. I was shocked how much lying. I mean, he lied all, everything. It was all a lie. And it was just all a lie. What is the truth? This one's hard to say. Um, but after I read all the journals... And I read the things how it felt to her. I, it looked good to me, but all the things I read about her, uh, the truth is that um, her death was not as bad as her life. I, that, that's so hard to say, but every day you're listening with somebody that's lying. You never know, are you up, are you down? They're controlling you, they're this, they're that, and all of the stuff I read, the truth is, as much as her death was so bad, she's glad to be on the other side. And her life with him was was not good. That's the truth. Terry, I don't even know how to end this up with that. Well, I think the one way we can say this is, uh, one thing that I learned is I really believe in the other side. Somehow my mother did something to let me know that there are people that love us so much and they are with us and there are angels and they do amazing things for people when they have to. 
to help them. You said that in order for you to believe in heaven and in order for you to believe in God, you have to believe that people, once they pass, when these things happen, yeah. that it's real. Yeah. And I do, without a doubt. I, 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 just, I just know it. And um, she's done a lot to come back. And I mean, I, you know, yes, I went after shows, but you know how many shows continue to come uh, even after 13 years? That's not an accident. This story is a story that's important. It's important. Is it for your sister? Is it for your mom? Is it for whoever it is? If you see those signs, the red flags we talked about, if you see any of those things and you can't find information about him and all the things you heard me talk about, and even though he's handsome and they look good and this all should be a great relationship, but there's something that's always as she said, tapping on your shoulder, you feel. Well, I have to believe that somebody listening right now has having a real, a real awakening and yeah. they're, they're going, oh my God. Yeah. She's talking to me. Yes. And that's what matters. Yeah. Now. And if you are family, this was what I was heard, is that to keep going in there and telling them to get out, they're under a syndrome. You can't do it while they're there find a way to, oh, the family's going to go on a thing and we're taking mom and get her away of course, or get her away for a couple of days and then start saying, how are you feeling? Well, I'm feeling relaxed. You got to get them a little out mm -hmm. of the, the, the ether. Because they're dazed and they're brainwashed yeah. and they're afraid to. Yeah. Because you can't, and I, and I wrote in a book, you know, get in there and take them out. And my, my mother came back and said, no, that's mm -hmm. not what you do. It's all about, it's got to be choice. And it's all about what we're all learning. Thank you so much oh, thank for you. letting me interview you. Um, listeners, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for listening and being with us. Um, there you have it, the truth. Thank you so much. I enjoy that I can share. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You bet. That was good. That was good. Hey, 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 h